greetings again to everybody who is using this magnificent series of lessons as um, an extra help, an extra item of preparation for your soon and coming English first edition language final exams. This is the fourth lesson in the series. And as you can see by what's on the screen, in this lesson, we are going to investigate how to improve your transactional writing. Now, in the very first of the series, we saw that paper three is the key to good marks. There are two reasons for this. First, it's the paper with the most marks. Second, it's marked using a rubric, not a memorandum. So achieving higher marks in this paper is easier than in any other. Also, there's one other factor. This is not really a paper for which you can study. This is a paper where the skills that you have acquired over the years are put to use. Now, this does not mean you cannot prepare for the paper. Yes, you most certainly can. And that is what we are going to do again in this session. So, welcome to transactional writing. And because you are first editional, first editional language English, you are going to be given um, a choice of both a long transactional and a short transactional piece to write. The long transactional is out of 30, as we saw earlier. And of course, your short transactional is out of 20. And combined with your essay mark out of 50, that will give you a result out of 100 marks. Right, let's take a look at this from a practical point of view, transactional writing. And the first thing is, learn the correct format. Format. If you look at the rubric, and we are shortly going to look at the rubric with which these things are marked, format is mentioned heavily. Okay, let's rephrase that. Format is specified. I wouldn't say mention, because mention means to comment upon something lightly. But format is specified as an important criteria. And as long as your format is good, the chances are you're going to get a good result. But I have a few other little hints and tips to give you. So let's start looking at the rest of them. Now, the first thing with your transactional writing, determine if the language to be used is formal or informal. It matters. It really does matter. OK? And, well, you'll see why in a minute. Here, look. The language in informal tasks is easier to use and usually results in a higher mark. I've marked thousands of these things, literally thousands of them, and I assure you that the informal tasks are normally the ones that will produce the best results because you do not have to worry so much about getting the language correct. Now, informal tasks include, of course, the friendly letter or the informal letter, dialogue, speech, advertisement, diary entries, and postcard. So always, um, when you are given your selection to make, and we'll look at how the selection works in a minute, look first at whether you have been given the choice of these. In the long transactional section, friendly letter, dialogue, and speech. And in the short transactional, or shorter transactional, advertisement, diary entries, and postcard. Those are your informal pieces. Now, let's take a look at how the transactional texts work in paper three. First, the longer transactional. 120 to 150 words. And here is the makeup of 
how the choices are granted. You will be given one choice from category A, which is letters. You can have a friendly letter, a formal letter, or a letter to the press, but it will only be one of those three. Next, an obituary or a CV with a covering letter. Now, up to recently, I have always said that the CV and covering letter cannot be asked in an exam. I was wrong. I finally saw how somebody had asked a logical question in the media paper, um, asking for a CV and a covering letter. The CV was fairly obvious. I mean, you fill in your personal details, but it's the covering letter that really mattered. And it was a good logical question. So normally in the old days, I said, learn the obituary if you want to choose one of those. Don't bother about the CV and covering letter because they can't give it to you. I have been proven wrong. <laughs> so <laughs> um, learn the CV as well. CV is very easy, don't worry. Good. Now your next category, one of the following. Report or review or newspaper or magazine article or agenda and minutes of a meeting. Okay, one of those four. And then finally, either speech or dialogue. And wow, I hope you get a dialogue because that always produces the best marks in the <laughs> transactional text. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> My apologies, I still haven't fully recovered from a rather nasty bout of flu. However, let's move on here. Now we go to our shorter transactional texts. Oh, note the length as well. 120 to 150 words and the shorter texts, 80 to 100 words. It mustn't be longer and it mustn't be shorter, please. Now, your first choice, either an advertisement or invitation card. Now, when we talk about advertisements, we are talking about, obviously, magazine or newspaper advertisements or posters or flyers. All of those are types of advertisements. Okay? So you've got either an advertisement or an invitation card. Section B. Diary entries or postcard... And the reason why I always laugh at this postcard story is that nobody actually needs to fill in a postcard anymore. But we'll go into that in a bit of detail later. However, um, if you are given the, uh, the choice, it's a very good choice to take because it's informal writing and you normally write in abbreviated sentences. Good. Then, instructions or directions... Once again, I tend to find that that's also a very good option. In the shorter transactional texts, um, usually all of the choices re can result in very good marks, especially if you are creative. Now, I've just made a note here. You must select only one longer text and one shorter text. But before we move on, and while these are in, on the screen, please note... Just a reminder, you will be given four choices of transactional, of longer transactional texts. Either a letter, any type of letter, there will only be one choice. Or B, your next choice is obituary or a CV with a covering letter. The chances are it will be an obituary because setting a CV with covering letter question um, is actually very difficult and the examiners avoid it. That's not to say you can't get it, but um, if you are good at writing obituaries, well, hopefully you'll get given an obituary choice. Then, report, review, article, or agenda and minutes of a meeting. Okay, one of those, and then last one, either speech or dialogue. Okay, this is how an exam must be set. This is official exam guidelines, or these are official exam guidelines. 
You're shorter, it'll either be a form of advertisement or an invitation card. Your next choice will either be diary entries or a postcard. And finally, either instructions or directions. All right, good, let's move on. Let's start first with letter writing tips. Informal letters. Now, once again, just before we go on, I want to stress the only time you will ever write an informal letter, possibly, is in an exam. If you are given the choice of an informal letter in an exam, or in the November final exam, it will be the last time that you write one. Why? Well, let's take a look here. Just bear with me. Um, there we go. Cell phones. The reason nobody writes informal letters anymore is because of these things. When we want to send a message to somebody, we're not going to go to all the trouble of writing it by hand on a piece of paper and putting it into an envelope and going off to the post office and buying stamps and posting it and possibly it gets to the guy in two weeks' time. No. We're going to send him a WhatsApp message. If you're really old-fashioned, you'll send him an SMS. Um, the informal letter is dead. It's absolutely dead. It is never used anymore in real life. Well, I haven't seen one used for many years now. And so, you know, go ahead, learn the format, and possibly you'll get asked an informal letter question in your exam. And that is that, as far as the informal letter is concerned. So let's take a look at our letter writing tips. First, check the address. This is the only complicated bit of an informal letter. Is it local or is it international? If it's local, you do not include the country's name. If it's international, you do include the name of the country. And what's more, very often you will be asked to send a letter home from another country. Please don't get your address confused. If you are sending it, for example, from the United States, then you must put as part of your own address, must, you must include USA. Okay, as easy as that. That's the only really complicated bit of this. Obviously, the content must have an introduction, a body, and a conclusion. That's how any letter works. And your introduction must be original. Uh, this drives me mad. This is the one that I always see. I am pleased to be writing this letter to you, da, 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 da. Or the other one, you know, I am fine, how are you? Going? You know, that's, those are really awful introductions. Make your introduction new and lighthearted. Usually it's lighthearted. I mean, the whole thing about informal letters is that they, they tend to be very friendly. It's also called a friendly letter. All right, so you can wangle your English a bit, you know. Use, have an opening sentence with, life is great here in the States, with an exclamation mark, something like that. As long as it's different, and it must have a bit of enthusiasm to it, please. Now, the content is friendly and informal. Is your tone correct? Okay, it must be friendly and informal. And then, your salutation and conclusion. Do not, your salutation is your greeting. Um, you'll keep that very informal. I mean, if you're writing to a friend, let's just say you're going to say something like, um, Dear Tabo, and that's it. You don't need to go anymore. You don't need his surname. Just first name is fine. Or dear um, Rafilwe, or, or <laughs> to whomever you are writing. Just the first name is fine. And when you sign off, your ending. Um, also, just your first name is fine. Okay. Then, do not end with yours sincerely or yours faithfully. This is an informal letter. These, sincerely and faithfully, are formal endings. Please bear that in mind. Um, if you are writing, for example, to a friend, you would simply end off saying, your friend, Timothy, or whatever your name is. Okay? If you are writing to your parents, you'd say something like, 
your loving son or your loving daughter, etc., and then your name. It's informal, and you don't sign it. Okay, please bear that in mind. That's the one trap, or it's one of the two traps into which you might fall. Firstly, the over-formal ending, and second, um, the incorrect address where you either include or don't include um, the country. All right, bear those things in mind, please. Now we come to formal letters. A lot of the tips here are the same as for the previous one, but back to front. Take a look here. Ensure that you use the correct format. Now, be warned. Format matters. And when you are dealing with the formal letter, it has the most complicated format of any long transactional task. So if you are going to choose the formal letter option, Fine, I'm not saying you mustn't, but make sure that you are fully familiar with the format. Okay, now I'm going to, at this stage, just very briefly, I'm going to go back to this document camera and I'm going to find the, well, let me first show you the book which I'm going to use. Here is the English Handbook and Study Guide. There we are, there's the title of the book. Here are the authors, Beryl Lutrin and Marcel Pincus. Okay, this is a fantastic book. Get your hands on it if you can, I've said this before. It's got so many useful things in it, it's beyond belief. Here is the format of a business letter. They call it a business letter, I just call it a formal letter. There you see, address, wait, let me use a pen. I'll use a lovely red pen as a pointer. Your address, date, the recipient's um, name or position and address, the salutation, dear sir, whatever, the brief summary of the, the letter, then of course, introduction, body, conclusion, ending. Now, please note the ending. Yours faithfully, signature, and then the name written out by hand. This is an excellent example of letter format. Okay, it is found on page 78 of this book. There I have acknowledged my sources. I do not want you to go away and photocopy this. What I would like you to do is buy the book for yourself. It is money well spent. Okay, photocopying is... Breach of copyright, don't do it. Okay, but there we are. How do you like that? Good, going back to our notes. Now, format, there we've looked at that. Now the next thing, this is critical. You are writing to a specific person. If the person's name is not known, then use a position or rank. In the book, it's got the chief accountant. Okay, very often we'll have the, um, the store manager, or maybe the managing director, or maybe the personnel manager, or something like that. Or if you're writing to a school, you can be writing to the principal. If you don't know who the principal is, it's just the principal. If you do know who it is, then you would address it to the name and position. In other words, something like Mr. Smith, the principal, um, the Christie College, Etc. Etc. Okay, but it's always, always, always a letter is always to a specific person. All right, bear that in mind. Now, if the person's gender is known, if you do know that it's either a man or a woman, then you must not send a letter with a salutation saying. Dear Sir, Madam, that is annoying. My bank drives me mad. I won't say which bank I am with, or with which bank I am. But they are forever sending letters addressed to me. My name is always on the envelope with Mr. in front of it. And then when I open up this letter, it's obviously a mass-produced letter which has been sent to 14 trillion South Africans because it says, Dear Sir, Madam, 
I am not madam. I am sir. I am male. I have a beard to prove it. All right? So do not fall into that same error that my bank so grievously commits every time they send me a letter. Bear that in mind. All right? Oh, I had a funny one. I set the, um, my grade 10 some years ago, I set them an informal letter where they would simply write to their favorite teacher who had helped them the most over the years. And four of them out of that class of, I think it was in those days, about 40, four out of the 40, in other words, 10%, addressed their letter to dear sir, madam. <laughs> they were not even sure of the gender of their own teacher. Terrible. So watch out. Avoid this if you can. Good. <clears throat> now, here we are onto the formal letter. So, now it is required to write yours sincerely or yours faithfully. Then, a signature and a name. There's three elements in the ending of the formal letter. Yours sincerely or yours faithfully. Your signature and then the name. Now, just while we're on the, the subject, remember that you, um, on, in your final paper three, you may not use your own name. Your own name may not appear anywhere in there. Make up a fake name. I think I've made a note of this here. Sorry, let's just go back to that before we move on. All right. Make up a fake name, make up a fake address, and make sure that your school's name doesn't appear anywhere either. Okay, moving on. Now we come to letter to the press. Okay, letter to the editor, letter to the press, whatever you want to call it. This one does create problems in the exam. Unless you are familiar with what's going on here, I do not recommend this. If, of course, you understand what a letter to the press or a letter to the editor is all about, then by all means go ahead. But be careful. There are several traps into which you can fall. Now, the format is the same as the formal letter. The difference is that you simply leave out dear in the salutation. You don't say dear sir or dear madam. You just say sir. It's very abrupt. It's terse. But that's the way we do it. Okay? Next. Remember that you are not, in fact, writing to the editor. You are writing to the readers of the publication, and the editor is merely giving you the chance to share your views with the public. Very important, this. Okay? Um, you do not address the editor directly. Now, here we've got this um, important. Use a fake name and address for any letter in your final exam. Reminder. Your name, the name of the school, or the name of your town or city may not appear in that exam paper anywhere. So work out for yourself now a fake name and address to use. Please. Mr. Malema, have you got that? Mr. Mbeki, have you got that? All right. There we are. Good. Now, oh, two things. I'm going to go back just for a second to the formal letter. Informal letters are obsolete. You're never going to use them. However, formal letters are not obsolete. You are going to use them because when you send an, an email, a real formal email, it is nothing more than a formal letter sent electronically. These are commonly used. So whereas I'm very skeptical about teaching informal letters, the same does not apply to the formal letter. You are going to be required to write these one day. Please learn them. And the same goes for the letter to the editor. Now, very seldom will you write a letter to the editor using paper and a pen. No. You're going to type it onto a computer, or possibly you're even going to type it in on your cell phone. And you're going to send it electronically. But the point is, people do still write letters to the editor. Just because it's sent electronically as opposed to through the post office doesn't mean that it's obsolete. These things are still perfectly valid. Okay. And there we have fake name and address. Okay, fine. Good. Now here, rather than explain an obituary, I wrote one some years ago. Um, 
Here is a, a fictional account, but this will give you some idea of ideally what an obituary should be like. Okay, now the first thing at the top there, you've got the titles, okay, and the person's first and last names. And equally fictional, I'm sure you can see that. Um, the date of birth, 1960, and the date of death, 2058. Okay, so we're looking back <laughs> from a distant future, right? And your introduction. Look at the elements in this now. It is with the deepest regret that we announce the passing away of David, the headmaster Matopa, yesterday in a vehicle accident. He was 98. All right. David, please note the use of the first name, was born and raised in the Lakota province, formerly the Free State, in the town of Xiangtiang, formerly von Staden's Riss, where he attended school and achieved noted success both academically and on the soccer field. After completing his studies with distinction at UOFS, he returned to Tapalong School as a teacher, rising to be HOD, languages, and subsequently the principal. In 2014, David joined the then new Constitutional Justice Party and was elected to Parliament. After the CJP achieved a majority 10 years later, he held several cabinet posts, including education and defense. He retired in 2050, having served his country with distinction. Okay. This Sunday past, David was driving from his home towards Winneville, formerly Mangong Bloemfontein, when a tire burst on his beloved Grand Jeep Cherokee executive, causing him to swerve and collide with an oncoming road train. He was killed instantly. David is survived by his third wife, Charlize, three children, seven uh, grandchildren, ten great-grandchildren, and one great-great-grandchild who mourn his loss along with the whole nation. Funeral arrangements will be announced shortly. Bear with me. The reason I went through it in total is merely to show you this is really how an obituary should be structured. You've got first the person's ranks and name at the top, okay, year of birth, year of death. This is, this is the real, the, the genuinely formal way of doing it. You have an introduction which includes the person's age, even though you can work it out from those dates up above. Um, you have a brief, um, what do you call it, a biography of the person, and keep it brief, okay? You have a brief account of his achievements. Don't overdo the achievements, uh, because otherwise it ceases to be an obituary and becomes a eulogy. If you just focus on achievement, that's eulogy when you praise the dead person. Okay? Cause of death, briefly, once again. Surviving family members. And funeral arrangements. Those are the elements of a full and complete obituary. Make sure that you have all of that. Introduction. Brief biographic details. Brief account of achievements. Cause of death. Surviving family funeral arrangements. That's all there is to it. Okay, get that right and you're doing fine. Right, enough of obituaries. Let's move on. Reports. Now, a report can be formal or informal, but either way, they tend to be very short, sweet, and to the point. Okay, it's factual. Reports are factual, clear and detailed, as if making a statement to the police. Imagine walking into the police station and saying, oh, I was so terrified that I nearly fainted. The cops aren't interested in that. They are merely interested in what happened. Why are you terrified? Okay, so the guy's, you know, <coughs> excuse me for that. The guy stuck a gun in my face. Okay, was threatened with firearm. That's all that interests the police, and this is what reports are all about. It's got to be factual, clear, detailed, precise. The report must be informative. Nothing else. Reports should not contain figurative language. Figurative language is great in an essay. It's great in a poem. It's great in literature, but not in a report. I mean, reports are just that, raw, clear details. It's like summarizing. We'll look at summarizing in one of the next lessons. And it's the same story. Summaries should not contain figurative 
language. A summary is to reduce something to its bare bones. And there we have an excellent description of a report. No figurative language. You are describing what happened, or you are describing the results of your research into something. It's formal and clear and straightforward. Now, reviews. People, reviews are a problem. When we mark the papers, very few people select reviews. And I can understand why. In our area of the Free State, very, very few people buy publications which have reviews in them. It is becoming more and more rare for me to see reviews. I meant to, I must apologize by the way, I meant to bring along a copy of a U magazine today because the U magazine is one of the few items that I still read regularly uh, which has reviews in them. But all is not lost. Let us do a little test here. Now, the best way um, to get used to doing reviews, if you want to, read examples of them. There are plenty of examples out there. And I'm going to do a quick demonstration of the best way to get examples of reviews. Now, I'm going to switch over to the document camera. Okay. And here we have it. And here's my cell phone. Okay, turning it on. Right. And there is Google. Okay. Now I'm going to do this through voice activation. Restaurant reviews, Bloemfontein, South Africa. There we are. Restaurant reviews, Bloemfontein, South Africa. Here's, for example, I don't know if you can see it on the document camera. Let's just see if it goes into focus. Yes, there we go. Let me put the whole camera down. And you can see, there, there are reviews for you to read. And why not? This is the best way for you to see what reviews are like. Okay, there's restaurant reviews. Okay, but there are many others. Let's try something slightly different. Going back. Okay. Book reviews, new publications. There we are. Let's see what happens. Okay. Are you following what I'm saying here? This is the best way to get hold of reviews. Okay. It can be book reviews. It can be drama. It can be the latest movies. Newly released videos, whatever. That's how to do it. And here, I've just given you a demonstration of a way to get hold of something which is useful in your English exams. And definitely, that will be useful to you. But this tool sitting in your pocket, this incredible research device, I encourage you to use your smartphone. Google when you have questions. Google, if any um, strange word, you come across a strange word and you want to find out its meaning, okay? It'll improve your diction. Use your Google. Use your smartphones to do research and recording and all the wonderful things that you can do. I am very much in favor of the cell phone in the classroom because it is so useful. Yes, 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 I know it's got disadvantages and it can cause distractions if the people are on social media, etc., etc., etc. But as far as I'm concerned, the advantages of this incredibly useful modern technology far outweigh the disadvantages. And I'm stating that for the record. I am tremendously in favor of encouraging the use of cell phones in a classroom, not discouraging them. But let's go back to our notes now. OK, reviews. Let me just reset my phone so that it's no longer on Google. I don't want to chew up too much data unnecessarily. Now, your review may be of a book, a movie, or a restaurant. And when I say a movie, that can also be a theater production. A movie and theater production are the same thing, really. Now, let's take a look. If it's a book, 
<coughs> you will need to have the title, the author's name, the publishing company, and of course the price. And in a normal review, which I haven't put these details here, um, you'll give it a rating. Um, do you rate this as, you know, good? Do you rate it as mediocre, poor, excellent, not worth the trouble? You are allowed to make these comments. And in certain publications where they actually do book reviews, they will give it a star rating from one to five, with one being absolutely awful and five being absolutely brilliant and you should not miss it. Okay, then, theatre production or movie. You're going to need the, the title, the um, director's name, the producer's name, and the names of the main actors. You should also have certain details such as what genre of movie is this? Is it a horror movie? Is it a comedy? Is it action? Is it suspense? Is it drama? Is it a love story? You know, is it a, um, a murder mystery? Something like that. Okay, so include details like that, right? And then your restaurant. Now, restaurant reviews, you need quite a lot of detail. Um, in today's society, you'll need the location of the restaurant. You'll need parking details. Is there enough parking close by? You'll need the decor. In other words, how the place is decorated, what it looks like on the inside. Um, you'll need the menu. Is it an extensive menu or is it very brief? And uh, does it have lots of variety on it? The type of food. You know, you get steakhouses and you get Italian restaurants and you will get Chinese restaurants. Okay, so these things are going to vary. The service. If a restaurant has bad service, you're not going to go back there. If it has good service, however, you are going, if you, the service is good and the food is good, you are going to go there again and you're going to recommend it. And unique features. Um, some restaurants, for example, have full-size aircraft hanging from the ceiling. Um, other restaurants have fish tanks all over the place. And um, in some really top quality restaurants, you can go up to the fish tank and point to the meal that you would like to have. <laughs> They've even got an advert about that, I believe, on TV at the moment. I don't watch TV much myself, but I've been told about it, and apparently it's quite good. Okay. Um, right, there are your main reviews. Now, just a review, uh, um, a comment here. A review should be as balanced and fair as possible, but factual. You don't want to be overcritical. You don't want to let your personal beliefs get in the way. If, for example, you are a vegetarian, you are the wrong person to review the opening of a steakhouse, a new steakhouse. Don't be silly. Okay. So, um, you know, vegans, vegetarians, whatever, believe that it is bad to eat meat for whatever reasons. I am not a vegan or a vegetarian. Okay, I do not share that opinion. So if you go and review a restaurant and tell me it's awful because it serves meat, I'm going to laugh at you. Okay, so please be reasonable. But I'm going to stress this again. Um, if you're serious about this, and if you're not sure how reviews should look, simply Google or otherwise if you come across books and magazines with these things in, read them. But it's so much easier to just pick up your cell phone than to go scratching around and looking for magazines and stuff. Keep it realistic, people. Right, moving on. Newspaper or magazine article. Very simple. The format. Title, and then technically, you are supposed to have a byline with the author's name. Please remember, don't use your real name. And, of course, the location where it was written. So if I were to be writing this, I would put there, um, let me say, um, John Smith, uh, mm, De Wetstorp. <laughs> I'm in Bloemfontein at the moment. So I'm picking another destination. Okay. So, and then you go ahead and you write the article, and that's that. Um, Format of a magazine article. Um, some people say it must be written in columns. Other people say, no, just use normal paragraphs and stuff. Um, it does look better in columns, but there is no 
prescription that says you have to write it in columns. The only thing is that your paragraphs should be very short, your sentences should be fairly short. Okay, lots of paragraphs and short, sweet sentences, that's that. There is no prescription in the um, uh, um, memorandum of this about how you have to structure your newspaper or magazine article. Let's move on. Oh, sorry, uh, I forgot to mention this. Avoid the use in the newspaper or magazine article. Avoid the use of the first person. That's I, me, we, us. As soon as you include that, um, the article starts to sound subjective. In other words, it's being tempered, it's being tainted by your own opinions. All right? Avoid that. Editors writing an editorial are allowed to be subjective. They are offering their opinion about a recent news event or something like that. But a standard newspaper or magazine article is not an editorial. It is a report on something or someone. And it must be, well, objective. So stick to he, she, it, them, they. That's the third person. Don't go into the first person. Now, agenda and meeting minutes. Fairly straightforward, this. Quite an easy one, if you've learned it. And I've seen some excellent results coming from a question set on this. Uh, usually, they will give the agenda, and then your task is to write the minutes. And it's quite easy, because you take the items in the agenda as headings for the minutes. And then you just fill in what happened underneath that. Um, I hope I've, sorry, I just want to go back and still commenting on agenda and meeting minutes. Always written in the third person. He did this. She said that. You know, he produced this evidence. Um, she agreed to carry out the task, etc., etc., etc. Okay, never I. Okay, even when referring to yourself, you will refer to yourself by your title and, sir and name. Uh, it's very formal, all right? Please bear that in mind. Speech. Formal or informal, yes. But it's a good option because even the formal speech is allowed to have informal language in it. You're not going to stick to strictly formal language in it, even in the most formal of speeches. You're going to be slightly lighthearted. Um, it's pretty straightforward. Greetings, introduction, body, conclusion. Don't forget the greetings. Uh, just be warned, don't use up half the speech greeting 20 or 30 people individually in the audience. Um, that's not going to be a very good speech at all. A speech must address the given topic. Keep your greetings down to one sentence and no more, please. And try to include a bit of humor, please. Even if it's just one or two or three words to make the, the poor marker who's reading this, make the marker smile a bit. We like to smile, honestly. Now, dialogue. Now, I've put this as a hint. Dialogues usually produce the best results in this section. And you notice I'm not going through this item by item. I haven't animated this. I want you to look at this in detail. Because if you are given a dialogue option, it is the best one in the long transactional section. A dialogue is between two people. Do not include third people in the dialogue. Please understand that, only two people. That is why it is normally, and here I've noticed this, a phone call or an interview. Phone calls are between two people, never more. Interviews, you've normally got one person sitting behind a desk and the other person who's being interviewed for a new job or whatever. Um, or otherwise it's the uh, the grade 11 who has been called into the principal's office because of something appalling that he has done or that she has done, depending on whether you are male or female. Okay, but it is a one-on-one -on -one interview. Where a dialogue should contain... <coughs> Excuse me for that. A dialogue should contain only two speakers. That's 
that. And then I've, I've made a note here also. Do not include the greetings. If, for example, it's an interview, I don't want to hear knock on the door, come in, hello, how are you, I am fine, please sit down. You've just chewed up 50 words without actually starting a dialogue of any value. Don't include the greetings. You go straight into the topic. You'll have, for example, the interviewer saying to you, Mr. Smith, I see that you are qualified in advanced nuclear physics and thermodynamics or something like that. And the response will be, yes, I studied in at UOFS and um, it's a brilliant university. <laughs> like UOFS. <laughs> um, but I mean, the whole point is there. Um, stick to the topic. You want good content. You want a valid dialogue, not greetings. Greetings are boring. Okay. But please choose the dialogue. The format is so easy. It's speaker, colon, and what is being said without inverted commas. It's direct speech, basically using no inverted commas. And then, of course, extra information is inserted in brackets. So the, the, the format is very easy, and it's informal language. That's what's so wonderful about dialogues. I mean, you are using informal language as people actually speak. So you can use contractions and you can use colloquial expressions. It is fabulous. Sorry, let's just go back while we're talking about this. The dialogue option is far and away the best of all the options. And I would encourage you, if you get given that option, consider that one before you consider any of the others. Um, the chances are you'll be very pleased that you did. Moving on. Advertisement, poster, and flyer. Now, we said earlier, all of these are, in fact, adverts. <laughs> did that get your attention? Did that get your attention? Yes, I'm sure it did. Okay, that's what it's all about. Now, I'm allowed to write that because I am not indulging in graphic sex or explicit sex or graphic violence or anything like that. I merely put two words onto the board which are to attract your attention. It's got absolutely nothing to do with the advertisement. But the whole thing is you've got to do some, something to grab the attention of the reader, or in this case, the marker. Okay, it's a great choice. I love a good advert. So be creative, be original, come up with something different. See what you can do to really, you know, clutch onto, grab the attention of the person reading it, okay? Now, you may use pictures and borders to attract attention, but no marks are given for these directly. <coughs> Excuse me. So, remember, it's only your words that are assessed. Pictures, borders, that sort of thing may appear in the advert, usually, unless they specifically say, do not use pictures or borders. You are allowed to use them, but remember also, don't spend too much time on them because they are not going to get you any marks directly. Use variety in your fonts. Use big letters, small letters, bold letters, italics, fancy letters, okay? It's all about the words in your advert. And whatever you do, make sure that you have at least 80 words in your advert because it is short transactional is from 80 to 100. Got that? Now, adverts are all constructed on this principle, the AIDA principle, attention, interest, desire, and action. All right? The attention is grabbed, such as with a, a clever statement such as that one. The interest is maintained. Once you've got his interest, you've got to make sure that you are offering the reader something that he wants, okay? So you'll post two or three fabulous prices for your item, or you'll say how wonderful your service is because you know that he really needs to have more advanced options on his cell phone, something like that. The desire, he will say, okay, this is for me. That's the, the closing argument, basically. And then, of course, your action. You must have some way for him to buy your product or to acquire your service. There must be phone numbers or 
um, uh, email addresses or a physical address or something like that. But you must be able to actually follow through with a sale. That's what advertisements are all about. And there I've put it. Do not forget the contact details. That's your action section. You must have contact details. There's a very clever radio advert which I hear on occasions. I'm not going to mention the place, but um, the advert just ends. If you're interested, Google us. <laughs> That's it. I just say Google. <laughs> very clever that. Because um, the, the advert itself is also quite a good one. And they end off just Google us if you want us. I thought that's very clever. Okay, but um, for the purpose of this, please, contact details. Rather overdo the detail than have too little. Can we move on? I think so. Invitation. To whom? To whom is the invitation addressed? Okay, it must have that detail. The address to which the person is being invited. It must have that detail. Okay? The date. If you don't have the date, the person won't know when to come. It must have the time that the event or party or wedding or funeral or what, no, no, I'm only joking. You don't, won't do an invitation to a funeral. But you must have the, these details. And then, of course, the dress code. All right? the person must know how to dress. Some parties run on themes, and they'll say, you know, everybody should come dressed in black and white, or, you know, come dressed as a, a celebrity or something like that. And then, finally, RSVP, which is a French, is based on the French, Respondez-vous, s'il vous plaît. Okay. That uh, Respondez-vous is the R, si vous plaît. Okay, you see that, S R S V P. When, by when must there be a response? To whom must the response be addressed? And how? It's perfectly fair to say, respond via cell phone. You can do that. that. That is how I would do it anyway. And what's more, I wouldn't send out invitation cards. I must be quite honest, if I send out invitations, I do it via cell phone. That's how it's done lately. Or via email. I know when they send invitations to us at the schools, they, the invitations come through via email, but very often, if it's only a small group, for example, if we're doing a, um, a little cluster meeting between five schools, um, then we'll all just receive the invitations via WhatsApp. Perfectly good. Nothing wrong there. But in this case, it's an, a written invitation. It is assumed that you are going to create an invitation card. Please note that, okay? So, all got, you, all got that, people? It must have these details. Let's move on. Diary entries. The format is very simple, but you must stick to the format if you choose this. It's a great choice because, once again, it's informal language. You don't have to um, make sure that you're getting um, all your words correct. Uh, you don't even have to write in full sentences. You can use sentence fragments. You can chuck it full of um, exclamation marks to show your emotion. You can ask rhetorical questions. It's a great choice. But I very seldom see people keeping diary entries lately. Nowadays, this, once again, has taken over as our diaries. I mean, I've still got my old cell phone dating back, um, what, six years now um, with all the SMSs, in those days I didn't even have much WhatsApp. Um, all my SMSs received and sent, um, which were of any interest, I kept on that phone. I've still got it. And one day I'm going to actually write those out and turn it into a very interesting record of events at the time because it's got some stuff that actually made a historical difference in South Africa. Anyway, day and date above each entry. So, Friday the 13th of July or whatever, all right? Monday, um, let me see, 16th July. You must ensure that you've got that. Now, diary entries, check how many are required. They can ask for one, two, or three. Whoever the examiner is, and you never know who the examiner is in a, a national paper, but 
They can require any one of those, one, two, or three entries. Do not mess that up. If you're only supposed to write one entry and you write three, only the first one will be marked. If, you write, if you're supposed to write three entries and you write only two, um, you will be penalized for not following instructions. Please check the instructions. That goes for any exam, obviously. Now, ensure a logical sequence. If it's supposed to be written um, a week apart, um, then you're not going to date one in May and the next one in August. Okay, that's not a logical sequence. And it must be sequential. <laughs> You know, um, if, you, if you've got diary entries from three different consecutive days, for example, then it'll be from the 18th and 19th and the 20th of July or whatever. Okay, so please make sure that your entries and your days and dates are as would be expected. Have you got that? Can we move on? Diary entries on... Because diary entries are written in the informal language, they're usually a good choice. I've stressed that already. Don't be shy to choose diary entries. Postcards. Now, this is the ultimate joke. Why we have to teach you guys postcards, I have no idea. But they said we do have to do it. So let's take a look at this. Here is an example of a postcard. This is quite probably the most common postcard found anywhere in the free state. I went down to the Mountain Zebra National Park some years ago and I found this postcard there. This is in fact a copy of it. That is the front of the postcard and this is what the back of a postcard looks like. You are supposed to put a stamp there and you write the address of the person to whom you are sending it. The name and the address is written on these lines here. Right, and this is where you write your hundred or so words because you haven't got space for many more than that. Now, why don't we send postcards anymore? Because a postcard has a picture on it and it shows what it's all about. Well, because while in the mountain zebra, I was riding around with my cell phone and this cell phone has a camera on it and I can rather than buying the postcard, I can take a photograph of a mountain zebra, that's what that is, and I can send it to my friend in the United Kingdom in 30 seconds flat, and I can include a brief message as well. So, why did I buy this postcard? Well, quite simply, so that I could teach it, because I don't think anybody in the country is ever going to see postcards sent again. They are obsolete and no longer useful, but we have to teach them. So I bought a postcard. Actually, I bought several more, but uh, this has become the most famous postcard in the free state for the simple reason nobody else has ever found one. <laughs> I mean, how ridiculous can you get? You are not going to walk, you're not going to buy a postcard, then go to the nearest um, post office and buy stamps, then you know, fill in the postcard, then drop it into a post box and hopefully it arrives at your friend's place in the UK a month later. It's silly. When you can do it, why must you spend 15, well, 15 rands for the postcard, then extra money for the postage, then don't forget your transport expenses getting off to the post office. Why? Why? We all have cell phones. Take a picture. Send it via WhatsApp or whatever. It's immediate. These are really obsolete things now. But as an exam choice, don't worry, it's not a bad choice. Let's just go back to our notes now. Okay, informal postcards, informal and fun, but no longer used in real life. And that sums it up totally. Good, moving on. Instructions, very simple, must include all the required details. Many examples of instructions, one of my favorite ones is um, to explain to me um, how to cook your favorite food. Or maybe I could ask you to describe to me how to set up a braai stand. That's perfectly valid. Or one of the ones, um, let's just say I'm BBT, born before technology, and I need to know how to Google something on my phone. Tell me how to, do a, how to Google 
on a smartphone. It's my first smartphone. Never had one before. Actually, <coughs> actually this thing's old as the hills. It's, this one's already obsolete. It's that old. But the whole thing is detail, detail, detail. And it must be <coughs> logical, clear detail. <coughs> Excuse me. Instructions may come as a bulleted <coughs> or numbered. <coughs> Excuse me a second. I really am coughing a bit too much now. Let me start. Instructions may be written in the form of a bulleted or numbered list. There's nothing to stop you doing that. And, I mean, the same goes for our next one. Let me just um, see. They must be very clear. Um, they must be unambiguous. When you are being told, for example, how to Google something on your new smartphone, um, there must be no doubt in your mind about what to do. The person giving you the instruction must be making it absolutely clear. And there I've put it as a detail may be written in point form. Okay? Whether it's bulleted or numbered or whatever, um, it, point form is quite a good way to do this. Okay? And the same thing with directions. Directions must enable you to reach your destination. If you can't reach your destination using the directions given, then they're no good. If, for example, I need to get to hospital in a hurry, and your directions are 80% correct, but don't enable me to get to the hospital after I've been bitten by a snake or something, they're not going to really help me very much. Because if I can't get to the hospital, shame too bad. The directions were valueless in spite of them being 80% accurate. So please pay attention to that. It must enable you to reach your destination. Then <clears throat> include all required detail. Read the instructions for directions to see what you are supposed to include. And do not connect all your sentences together with commas only. I that drives me mad. Directions, you know, go past the church and turn right and go on to the main road. Another thing you must never do is go down the road or go up the road. <laughs> that doesn't tell me what direction to take. Okay, let me just go back to that, sorry. And that is that as far as our transactional writing examples are concerned. I would like to, before we stop, I would like to take a brief look at a previous paper. So let's do that. We are going to go back to our favorite um, paper, which we've been using all the way through. Okay, that's the memo. Um, yes, we shall start by looking at this memo because it's going to tell us how a longer transactional uh, piece is marked. It also has some very interesting comments about it. Okay, here is the rubric for marking a longer transactional piece. Please take a look at this with me. Okay, it has many similarities to the um, essay rubric. Please notice it's first out of 18 marks. Um, the exceptional response, outstanding response beyond normal exp expectations. Intelligent and mature ideas. Um, extensive knowledge of the features of the type of text. Writing maintains focus, doesn't go off topic. Coherence in content and ideas. <clears throat> Highly elaborated and all details support the topic. Appropriate and accurate format. Okay, now look over here. Content, planning and format. And yes, you should plan your transactional texts. I know that many people don't plan, but it does help you very much to plan. Obviously, your planning style will be completely different from that of an essay. You will plan according to which text you've selected. <coughs> but planning helps you focus your mind on the work. Please plan. Let's take a look here. Tone, register, style, and vocabulary, highly appropriate to purpose, audience and context, grammatically accurate and well-constructed, virtually error-free. Yes, you can make a mistake or two. It can still be classified as virtually error-free because that means um, 
you know, so few errors that they don't have any effect. Please notice here where things start to go wrong. Um, tile, tone, register, and style, and vocabulary less appropriate to purpose, audience, and context. Inaccurate grammar with numerous errors. Limited vocabulary. And here's the disaster. Meaning obscured. As soon as you start to lose your meaning, then that's where you have trouble. Look also over here. Um, necessary rules of format vaguely applied. Some critical oversights. Format matters. Please take note of that. You cannot get an exceptional result if there are any errors in the format. So the best thing to do is either to make sure that you're an expert in the format or choose something which has a simple format. Now, I'm just watching the time. Yes, we have a few minutes remaining. There's your um, method of the marking. Okay. Now, let's go to our question paper. Bear with me. Here we are. Here's the question paper. <clears throat> and take a look at the actual questions given in an exam, along with their... There, got it. Along with some of the answers recommended. Now, here you've got a letter of application. It's an unusual letter, this. But it is simply a formal letter. Reply to the following advertisement that appeared in a local newspaper. There we are. Do you enjoy helping people? Are you knowledgeable about the local area? Come and join our caring team at the tourist office. We need a cheerful part-timer to answer the phone on Saturdays and help tourists make the most of our town. Please send your application letter to the manager. Right? And here it says, write a letter of application to the manager of the tourist office. Now, as soon as I look at that, I think, I have not been told whether the manager is a male or female. So this one is going to be one of those letters where you are allowed to use, dear sir, madam. And to whom am I going to address it? The manager of the tourist office. Okay, it's as easy as that. All right? And then, obviously, you have to motivate why you are the correct part-timer. Then here... Obituary, your grandmother passed away. She did voluntary work at the local clinic and was a beloved person in the community. You have been asked to write the obituary and to pay tribute to your grandmother. Now, this one here, and to pay tribute. Okay, you are going to eulogize her a little bit in this one. All right? You are allowed to say how wonderful she was, and obviously, you are going to specify about her voluntary work at the local clinic. That is how you are going to pay the greatest tribute to her and how she served the community that she loved so well. Okay, then note this one, formal report. This is an interesting one, by the way. Your school has decided to review the school rules. The principal has asked you, as chairperson of the Representative Council of Learners, to discuss the rules with the RCL. Right, write a report on your findings and recommendations. Brilliant, brilliant. I think that's excellent. And you can come up with a really good response to that by simply sticking to facts and details. Then, last one here. Da, 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 da. Dialogue. And this is quite a tricky one, eh? Your friend says to you, to be cool is to do what your friends do and be accepted by them no matter what. And then you have now got to respond to that. Continue with the dialogue that takes place between your friend and you. Isn't that a clever question? And I hope that you get a question like that in your paper. But I mean, that's an, an excellent example of a good, a, a, a magnificent dialogue question. And you can be cr tremendously creative. You can either agree with a friend or you can disagree, by the way. Um, obviously, uh, many people said, no, 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 you don't want acceptance at any cost. I remember reading some of these dialogues, and they were brilliant. So there we are, once again, the dialogue, the ultimate choice. 
Now, before we look, take a final look at our memo, let's just look at the shorter transactional texts. Okay, here we've got a flyer. You would like to earn some extra money during school holidays and have decided to offer your services to take care of people's dogs while they are away from home. Good. Design a flyer where you advertise your services. That's it. You're going to try to attract people so that you can go and take care of their dogs while they're away. I've done that, by the way. It's quite a good one. Now, diary entry. This was a brilliant question. We had fantastic responses to that, to this. You have just found a diary lying at the side of the road. You have no idea who it belongs to. There is only one entry. Write this entry. You see that one entry? Isn't that amazing? What a creative question. And how creative can you be about that diary entry? Fantastic. <clears throat> okay, directions. You have advertised your services to take care of dogs while the owners are away. One owner has responded and wants to bring her dog to your doggy daycare center. Give directions to this owner on how to get to your house from the shopping center. Write out the directions. And all you need to do is be very detailed and you will get a really good mark for that directions question. Now, bear with me one last time. We are going to go back to our memo and just take a look at the responses expected here. We'll first go to the um, long transactional sections. Letter of application. Remember that this is a formal letter. Okay, letter should be addressed to the manager, tone and register, formal, address of sender, date, recipient, address of recipient. Now, please note, recipient, the person. Greeting or salutation, topic line, suitable ending, initials and surname of sender, signature. Right. Okay, following information should be included in the uh, letter, among others. What makes the candidate suitable for position to work with people? All right. Then, the obituary, your grandmother passed away. Tone must be gentle, euphemistic, and tactful. Name and surname of the deceased must be mentioned. Not mentioned, it must be given <laughs> priority of place as the title. Cause of death may be mentioned. Yeah, that is normal, by the way. Details of funeral service and other arrangements are optional. No, please include details of the funeral service. You know, the funeral will be held at... Um, uh, the church of the, the magnificent sound system on date, whatever. Right. Tribute must be paid to the grandmother. That is important. Okay? It actually specified that. Good. Formal report. Report on the school rules. Report may be written in point or paragraph form. Okay. Writer and name of the recipient should be clearly indicated. Okay. Please, fake names. Remember that. The subject or topic should be indicated. Yes, report must be dated. Tone must be formal. And the following information should be included among others. The rules discussed, recommendations to keep or to change rules. That is logical. All right? No booby traps there. That is exactly how you would expect it to be, I'm sure. Dialogue. Between you and a friend on what is cool, a scenario must be given, okay, where this is taking place. The dialogue format must be used, which is very basic. Each speaker's name should be followed by a colon. Yes, that's part of the format. A new line should be used to indicate each new speaker. Yes, that's obvious. That's part of the format. Tone must be informal. Yes, you're speaking to a friend. Advice to characters or readers on how to speak or present the action must be in brackets before the words are spoken. Okay, so additional information in brackets. That's just part of the format. You see how absolutely easy a dialogue is. Let's move on to the shorter texts. I won't keep you for too much longer now. I'm sure you're very tired of transactional texts. Right, and here, flyer. A flyer is where you advertise your services to take care of the dogs. The candidate should use persuasive techniques in the flyer. The following should be included among others. Description of the services. Details of the cost, address, and contact details must be given. Okay. Note, marks are awarded for the content and not illustration. But 
If you want to do an illustration, you may. It doesn't say deduct marks for illustration. It just says no marks for illustration. It can be useful. I mean, obviously, if you're offering um, pet sitting and you're looking after dogs, put a picture of a dog on the thing. Make a fancy border if you've got the time to do it. No problem there. Diary entry. Now, please note, there should be one entry bearing a date. Uh, day and date, by the way. Day and date. That's the only format of diary entry. The entry may be a positive or negative entry. Emotions, whether negative or positive, must be clear. The tone should be personal and immediate. Yes, that's the tone of diaries. Okay, and then finally, directions. Chronological order must be used. In other words, um, you must go in sequence from shopping center to the house. You know, then turn right, then proceed through two traffic lights and turn left, etc., etc. Approximate distance must be indicated, two kilometers or whatever. Information about landmarks along the way must be provided. You know, obvious landmarks, uh, big churches, bridges, um, if you're going past an electricity pylon, anything like that. Perhaps a school with a big name on a signboard outside. The imperative form must be used. In other words, directions are in actual fact a type of order. Imperative means ordering. But this is not the sort of order when you're going to use exclamation marks. You're merely saying, go there. It's as if you're ordering, but it's being done politely. Concise, which means short and clear sentences must be used. And there we go. People, that is transactional texts. Um, I don't want to go into any more detail. I think we've covered them very thoroughly. This was the, the fourth in our series of lessons. These first four, all of them dealt with English first additional language, grade 12, paper three. At this point, we stop working with paper three. And if you look back over what we have done so far, the first two lessons in the series dealt with essays. The third lesson, the previous one, dealt with punctuation and spelling and probably was one of the most difficult lessons ever to watch because it was very technical. This one, the fourth in our sequence, the last in this um, series of the essay or the um, paper three lessons, here we have only looked at transactional writing. And at this point, we are going to be finished with paper three and proceed to one of the other papers that you are going to shortly be writing. But I shall not tell you yet which one is coming next. Lesson five will then be a surprise when you see it. People, thank you very much for your patience. Thank you for watching this and really try to apply the tips that you have been given in these lessons so far. I hope that you will be joining us for another lesson very shortly. Goodbye. <music>